Hello everybody, my name is Richard Smith, I'm the director of the Tank Museum and today we're going to be thinking a bit more about the nature of military culture and bravery. The Tank Museum is the regimental museum of the Royal Tank Regiment and we're also the core museum for the Royal Armoured Corps and the Royal Armoured Corps has two bits to it since 1939 when it was founded. It's got uh, the Royal Tank Regiment who've always served in tanks and the cavalry who are nowadays the successors of horse mounted troops. Now, if you watched my hats video, you'll know that I'm fascinated by what you can learn about people by looking at objects. When you look at a tank, for instance, what can you learn about the people who designed it, who who made it and the people who operate it? Um, I'm interested in military culture and in particular, I'm interested in things that look really odd. And one of the great epicenters of oddness are the cavalry. My central question I'm going to be thinking about today is, are they all mad? Now, I'm going to talk through some examples of why you could conclude yes to that question. But then I'm going to be thinking a bit about, about why maybe the real answer is not completely and being stuck at home, the examples I'm going to have to use today aren't going to be objects, but they're going to be events. Now, my logic for asking this question began about 12 years ago when I was speaking with a former cavalryman who was telling me about a relative of his, an ancestor, who'd taken part in the charge of the Light Brigade. Now, I began to realise that the relationship between British cavalry and the charge of the Light Brigade is a bit strange. Now, I'm sure most people uh, watching this video uh, know the, the basic story of the charge of the Light Brigade. You've got uh, October 1854, Balaclava in the Crimea War. Uh, they ride down the valley of the shadow of death and they get massacred. Now, it's marked every year in a number of cavalry regiments in Britain. And the charge of the Light Brigade and the way that this event is is, is recognised, uh, it's clear that it's not merely a commemoration, but this is a celebration and that for any self-respecting British cavalry officer, the charge of the Light Brigade is an aspiration, that the lingering feeling you get from these chaps is that they feel they were born 150 years too late and they missed out. Now, this is really strange to me that this celebration of disastrous defeat seems peculiar. And if you compare it, for instance, the same battle as the charge of the heavy brigade, which goes really well, and they completely ignore that. So this is a celebration of disaster. This, is, this doesn't happen normally. Companies in the future won't be celebrating the pounding that their share prices took during the coronavirus. Sony doesn't celebrate Betamax. Queen's Park Rangers Football Club don't celebrate their defeat to Oxford United in the 1986 Milk Cup final. And the charge of the Light Brigade isn't as isolated as you would think. One of my favourite stories uh, was about the 9th Lancers, British Cavalry Regiment, in September 1914. And when they carried out what was the last lance on lance action by British cavalry. Now, this is during the mobile phase at the beginning of the First World War. And you had two groups of cavalry fight an encounter battle with each other. And after a sharp fight, the Prussian dragoons are sent packing. And the British medical officer goes around the battlefield to kind of pick up the bits and in particular, the medical officers looking for the, the, the colonel of the regiment, a guy called David Campbell. And eventually he finds Colonel Campbell lying in a field of clover with bits sticking out of him. And Colonel Campbell is treated subsequently for, uh, I quote, a revolver wound in the leg, a lance wound in the shoulder and a sword wound in his arm. And he sums up the previous incident with the words... I've just had the best quarter of an hour I've ever had in my life. There 
very few people would describe the injuries they obtain in a car crash in the same sorts of terms. And I realised after a while that it's not just the British cavalry who exhibit this extraordinary celebration of getting gloriously slaughtered. Most people, for instance, could only name one American cavalryman, who's George Custer. And he's only famous for one thing, which is getting wiped out. Now, the cultural similarity isn't perfect between Little Bighorn and Charge of the Light Brigade. It's not celebrated in quite the same way. But the folklore and the heritage is remarkably similar. And this issue of how these things are then reflected, for instance, by Victorian artists, and the, even the fact that nowadays American cavalrymen will still wear a Stetson hat. Maybe someone in the comments would like to think about that a bit and, and explain the link. But all this seems very odd to a casual observer like myself. And being a bit on the wiped out side looks like a bigger and bigger theme the more incidents you look at. My favourite story of all cavalry stories, the, the one which for me brought the are they all mad question into sharp relief was actually a French one. And it's told in the wonderful French Cavalry Museum in Samur. If you've not been to Samur, it's great. You should go. The Cavalry Museum is terrific. The Tank Museum there is too die for. Go to Samur is wonderful. If you have to try and persuade your wife to go to Samur, don't mention tanks, mention horses, countryside wine. That gets you a much better chance of a pass. Anyway, the story that they tell uh, in this French cavalry museum in Samur that I want to relay to you today is a story of a battle in the Franco-Prussian War in 1870 at a place called Reichshofen. It's in the Alsace, which is the bit between France and Germany they keep squabbling over. And the key person in the story is a chap called Colonel de la Car. Now, what's happening in this battle is that the French army have just been defeated by the Prussians and they're running away, which I won't comment about at all. And the French cavalry are thrown in to deliver a stopping blow to the Prussians to enable everybody else to escape. And what happens in this battle is like a tick box exercise of cavalry culture. So the first tick in the box is the cavalry charge and they charge not to win the battle, but they charge as a suicidal sacrifice for the greater good. Tick, huzzah. The second tick is that Colonel de la Carre personally leads the charge of his regiment, the 3rd Cuirassiers. This is the right place for the commanding officer to be leading the charge. Huzzah! Tick. The third tick is the inevitable consequence of the second tick, because leading a cavalry charge in the 1870s is a pretty dangerous thing to do. Rifles getting quite modern, artillery's pretty lethal, and therefore with a certain sense of an inevitability. In the first two minutes, the colonel gets his head blown off by a cannonball. And the prized artefact that they display in Samur in their display case is his cuirass, his breastplate, with a dent on the top where his head's been removed. So the third tick killed, leading the charge. Huzzah! Tick. But the biggest, fattest tick of all is reserved for the fact that because Colonel de la Car is using a jolly good quality cavalry saddle, the mere impediment of having his head blown off by a cannonball does not prevent him from continuing to lead the charge. Tick. But do you think about this, that when the French cavalry are telling us this story, what they do is they don't tuck this around the back somewhere and show it as something to display the, the tragedy of warfare. This is right at the front. It's one of the first things that you see. And the message to the world seems to be that this is the aspiration of any self-respecting French cavalry officer, that if you do well, you could be like him. So... 
But these examples, maybe they are all mad. But let's think again. Let's think what this means and think what it means uh, for us here in the 21st century. That these stories have got quite a lot in common. If you look particularly at Balaclava, Reichshofen and Little Bighorn, they all occur in a 20 year period, give or take 20 year period, 22 years. And I don't think that's a coincidence regarding their role in folklore. That this period, the, the late 19th century, is a transition time for the cavalry. Uh, it's a time when closing with the enemy with a sword to sort out this battle at arm's length is getting a bit tricky. And it's even trickier considering the rather lethal set of stuff that the other chaps have got. And this was a period where the bravery required of cavalrymen is verging on the suicidal. But this period and the way it's commemorated and celebrated preserves a legacy of sacrifice and bravery which echoes through the ages to this very day. Now, I heard a talk a few years ago by a military historian called Richard Holmes, shortly before, shortly before he died. And a young troop leader, a young trainee cavalry officer, asked him the best question I've ever heard asked by a trainee officer. And the question was, what do soldiers expect from their officers? Now, after a moment's thought, Richard gave a timeless answer, which was courage and genuine eccentricity. And these two can't be completely separated, especially for the British and particularly for the cavalry, because bravery isn't about heading towards danger because you're ignorant of the risks. That's that's just idiocy. And bravery is heading towards danger, knowing full well what the risk is. It's when, for instance, what our healthcare workers are doing right now. They know what the risks of looking after seriously ill patients are. Uh, one of my favourite examples in the past is um, a chap called Joe Eakins. So again, his name will be known to many people watching this video uh, as one of the people who is most likely to have knocked out the tank of Michael Wittman in the Second World War. Shortly before Joe died, uh, I asked him, what was it like to fight up against German Tiger tanks? And Joe's answer was to look me in the eye and said, bloody frightening, I can tell you. Now, that's real bravery. So what we're seeing in things like the celebration of, of, of events like the Charge of the Light Brigade is a culture that celebrates bravery in its most extreme forms. So remember, of course, that the armies celebrate bravery in structured ways as well. Armies have got two hierarchies. They have a rank hierarchy, which is denominated by title, and they have a bravery hierarchy, which is dominated by, by medals. And both of these hierarchies allow you to change your name. So in, in Britain, your rank changes your name in front of your name and your bravery level changes your name after your name. And the British Army has, has achieved this remarkable feat, for instance, of making it socially distinctive to be in the most likely areas to be killed. So uh, traditionally, for instance, the most prestigious bits of the British Army uh, have been the guards and the cavalry who are in the heart of the battle in the most lethal places. So what does it mean for us in the 21st century? Well, in our 21st century bubble, where we become increasingly remote from, from people in the military, it's really easy to write off the peculiarities of our soldiers as unnecessary oddities. So if we think about uh, separate dining facilities for, according to your status, that just looks inefficient. The, if you look at the odd clothing, the bands, the parades, the, the hierarchical society, the shiny shoes, and of course, the hats. Now, quite a lot of these don't seem to add value. If you're a businessman, why would you do those sorts of things? Some of this stuff's expensive. And the temptation would be to see them as not only unnecessary, but dispensable. However, we need to recognise that all these things, all these things that can, to a civilian like me, seem strange, are part 
concept of a culture that celebrates and values bravery. I sometimes describe this as, as the Jenga tower of military culture, that theoretically, while you could remove some bits and pieces, for instance, you know, the British Army's reduced bands, it's having shared messes between different units, there's a danger of the next brick you remove from the tower could cause the tower to, to drop. And if that tower had taken you 300 years to build, then that would be a problem. I did a talk once uh, for young Royal Armoured Corps officers who were about to finish their training. And they were training for a role that was going to put them right at the front of the battle in the most dangerous place in the world. And I concluded my talk to them at the time by observing that the nation expected them to be the bravest men in the kingdom. And that this has been the case before, it was the case now, and it will be the case in the future. So as nations, we should be grateful for these wonderful young people who are of course absolutely barking, but they match this in equal quantity with their brilliance, and their bravery. Thank you very much. In these difficult times, obviously your support is really valued. So please do keep following us on social media, do subscribe to our channel. And, and if you've got the opportunity, perhaps order something from our shop, uh, join one of our schemes like Patreon or our friends organization, and we'll try and keep going with giving you some content to keep you informed and entertained.